I've learned from this conference so far. I think it's probably pretty obvious to most of you in the audience today. One, the Arab world is changing. Two, some of those change makers are right here in the seats next to you. What I want to talk a little bit about today is how, the, how to affect the policy that underpins that social change and why that's so important in the equation. Now, as the Arab Spring erupted about a year and a half ago, the U.S. was faced with one of the biggest challenges, one of the biggest foreign policy challenges that it had looked at in our generation. This was compounded by the fact that a large part of Congress was essentially new to the game. Because just a few months before, more than 100 new members had been elected to Congress. It was one of the biggest seat changes in history. In 60 years, we hadn't seen this many new faces on the Hill. So as these revolutions were occurring, as the protests were springing up in one country after the other, how did members of Congress reach out and listen to the voices on the ground? How did they connect with the activists and ask them, how should the U.S. respond here? Well, too often, they probably didn't. See, Washington policy circles can often be just that, circular. Loops of conversation among officials, academics, analysts, oftentimes lack insight, fresh thinking. And that kind of insight can only come from local input on the ground, from those kinds of young activists. What I want to talk to you today is about my plan to break those policy circles, to get those voices up to the hill so they do hear from them. See, as the revolutions occurred, members of Congress, they probably knew the ambassadors, and they knew the ministers, and they knew the analysts, but they didn't know the activists. They did, probably didn't even know how to log on to Twitter, and if they did, they sure didn't know how, who to follow or how to tune into those voices. So what I want to do today is to take a little bit of look at how we, how we can connect those voices a little bit better. It's not that members of Congress realize that those voices don't matter, or that they don't want to listen to them. In fact, they really do. They're just not quite sure how to reach them. Young people matter. The legacies of Muhammad Bouazizi and Khaled Saeed have imprinted that notion. That's very clear that if this generation, these voices are ignored or oppressed or, or feel frustrated, that violent, dramatic upheavals can occur, as we've all seen. So what I want to do is to set up a series of lunch briefings. I want to use one of Washington's favorite tools, a free lunch. Because right? even, in, even in these days, you can still have one. And I want to bring these young and inspiring activists up to the hill to meet with congressional staff, to tell them about the problems in their countries and how the U.S. can support them, what they would like the U.S. to do or not do. Through this project, these staff members can articulate to their bosses, to their members of Congress, why policies in support of democracy and human rights in the Middle East are so critically important right now. They'll build up a strong list of contacts so when they're faced with these tough policy challenges, they'll know who to call. And finally, as a welcome side effect, we'll, we'll get a little bit of that bipartisan cooperation in Washington that I think everyone would appreciate a little bit more of. But that's not going to be enough. Because oftentimes, even if the decision makers think it's the right thing to do, and they know they want to support these people, they may not actually do much of anything. That's where the rest of you come in. I know a lot of Americans are disenchanted with the political process especially young Americans. They say, my vote doesn't matter. The system's corrupt. You know, these two parties, they don't care about someone like me. But just as the youth generations in the Middle East made the difference in their governments, the youth here can, can do the same. Let me ask you a few questions to explain what I mean. This is the interactive part, so get ready. How many of you have heard of John McCain? Can I see a show of hands for John McCain? Very good, very good. How about John Kerry? All right, very educated uh, crowd we have here. Let's make it a little bit tougher then. How about Jared Polis? One hand, very good. How about Raul Grijalva? A few Arizonans, good, good. Now, Jared Polis and Raul Grijalva are two members of Congress who recently signed on to a bill about Bahrain and to promote political reform and human rights in that country and withhold an arms sale as, as a means of leverage to support that. 
Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, I went to the staff of Polis and Grelvin, and I asked them, well, why did you sign this bill? And they told me, essentially, well, it's the right thing to do. Well, the congressman cares about human rights. Uh, this is a situation he's really concerned about. And this was a way that, that he could voice those concerns. Oh, and we got a lot of phone calls about this. We got a lot of phone calls about this. See, somehow, a policy circle had been broken. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this phrase before, call your congressman, write your senator, right? How many of you have actually done that? Pretty good, pretty good. Maybe half, but this is probably a very politically active crowd. But as you can see, you know, most of the people in America today don't take those kind of actions. They don't really think those things matter. Because I just told you with the story with Grijalva and Polis, that had a major impact on their decisions, those phone calls. Because sometimes all it takes is 50 phone calls to really make a difference, to convince your member to take a public stand in support of these kind of policies. So if there's something you really care about, the steps for change are really pretty simple. One, find a bill that if, if you think it was passed, it would help the situation that you're concerned about, whatever issue, whatever country that might be. If no such bill exists, you know, find some other concrete steps that uh, different NGOs or activist groups are calling for. Two, look up and call your congressman. It takes about 60 seconds. Usually there's an intern on the other end. They don't really want to talk to you anyways. They just want to take down your concern and pass it on. But as we've seen, those concerns matter. As I said, sometimes all it takes is 50 people. Because at the end of the day, even if they don't vote the way you want them to vote, or even if that bill doesn't exist, all of a sudden, this issue is on their radar. It's something they've got to care about, something they've got to respond to in a way. And they're going to start reaching out, and they're going to send their staff out into those policy circles to figure out what's going on, what we should do about this. And if it just so happens that this coming Friday, there's a lunch briefing with an Egyptian blogger, a Tunisian activist, a youth activist from Morocco, they're much more likely to go much more likely to listen to those voices when they're trying to make policy going forward. And the circle is broken. So, you know, as, as people across the Middle East and North Africa stood up and they fought for their rights, and they demanded a seat at the table for their governments, they won that seat. But now it's time they have a seat in Washington, too. And everyone here needs to help ensure they have it. They need to create the space for them to have it. Because their world is moving too fast to keep up, and we need to make sure they do. Thank you.